victim, the victim can then make his declarations. Um, if you are agreeable to this, then we can start that right away. Good. Good. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. My name is Jewel Major. I'm Chief Counsel in the Office of the Attorney General. And appearing with me also from the Office of the Attorney General is Assistant D Director of Legal Affairs, Mrs. Kayla Green-Smith. And then Ms. Tiffany Moore, Senior Counsel. Good morning. And Ms. Ashley Sturp, Assistant Counsel. And they'll also be participating in the dialogue. Um, we truly un we understand what, you ha what the, the difficulties that you're experiencing right now, so we have no problem mm -hmm. proceeding with um, his with the petitioner. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, um, you have 20 minutes. I see. Madam President, Honorable Commissioners, um, Honorable Representatives of the State. Um, thank you uh, for giving us this opportunity to present a very important case uh, to this commission uh, that has been pending for quite some time, uh, since about 2010. Uh, we apologize for the uh, difficulties uh, with communications uh, that have occurred and wanted to thank the commission for understanding and for also uh, altering its format to allow us to uh, present in this fashion to make sure uh, that the petitioner can also be heard. Uh, given that uh, you know he's been waiting so long to be heard, and um, and this this hearing is is as much about him as about the issues. Uh, this morning, um, I'm I'm sorry. I believe the petitioner is actually is actually calling in right now. Yeah, he's attempting to to call in. Hello. Are you there, Dave Randa? Hello. Yes, uh, Mr. Mr. Monker, we're we're in the uh, can you? we're in the we're in the hearing. Um, Madam Commissioner, would you still I'm, like to us on, to, would you I'm like us to my... proceed with questioning, or would you? Um, Dave, could I say one thing, please? Uh, go, yes, yes, Can you do. hear me? So the electricity just came on. Um, can I get about three minutes? Well, um, sir, we were actually proceeding with the allegations in your case first to give you a chance to testify later on, and the state agreed to it. So, um, so he can take that time. Yeah, you can take that time, and, and the commission will come back to you. Um, what I would advise you is to, uh, if you have the electricity back on, to try to follow the hearing through the, uh, through the YouTube link so that you can also... Uh, See it that way. Okay. So, um, back on thank you madam president let, let, let's continue and you know uh, even in 2018 uh, technological difficulties cause us to have to move things around but thank you uh, you know also for allowing uh, the parties to appear in this fashion um, you'd be surprised how many courts do not allow that so thank you for understanding those issues um, this is the a petition human rights tribunal yeah <laughs> Absolutely. And the state has graciously accepted Yes, that. and the state has accepted, so we thank them for that. Um, case, this case involves, in an era where human rights is under siege across the world and in this hemisphere, sometimes it's difficult for us to focus on the day-to-day -day issues. When we have war in Syria, crisis, in uh, Venezuela affecting multiple countries and issues like this that affect the entire world, um, it can be difficult to focus on issues that affect families. This is a case that has affected one family and 
the issues in it affect many families and are emblematic of a situation that happens in the Bahamas and in other nations as well. And that is the reason that it is so important and, so, and, and that we are so glad that the Commission has decided to give us this opportunity to explain, first of all, the circumstances behind this very particular case and how the issues in this case relate to issues that affect the whole system. Um, my client, Mr. Marker, uh, he, when he uh, started having his legal problems which led to this case, uh, that was 11 years ago. Uh, he started this case in 2010 and he's been fighting this case uh, since the first issue came up for, uh, for about 11 years. Um, at the time, his three children were minors and under his care. Two of those children have now been raised to majority age. They will not ultimately receive the full benefits of the child maintenance that my client lost because of the issues that arose in his case. My client continues with his case because he hopes that, first of all, he can receive some form of justice for what has happened to him and his family, and second, so that future individuals that face these types of situations in the Bahamas and elsewhere do not have to go through these situations. Um, we provided the commission with a summary of some issues that we wanted to discuss in today's hearing um, in connection with the case. But let me summarize, because we're starting with the allegations, let me just do, provide a brief summary of the facts um, and what led us to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights uh, with a case that started out with a divorce. Um, my client uh, divorced his wife in the Bahamas back in 2007, started the divorce proceedings back in 2007. Um, through those proceedings, he received initially, um, initially this case started out as what seemed to be a typical case. He, uh, he received, uh, she had temporary custody, but then it was changed over to him when it became clear to the court that this was, uh, this was the better arrangement for the children. Um, he received a temporary child support order. And then um, a new judge came in, uh, Chief Justice Burton Hall, uh, to the case in 2008, and things started to change in the case. My client uh, decided to speak on the television about his, um, about uh, the difficulties of being a single father and raising his children. Um, when he went back into court, the judge told him that he shouldn't be doing that. He should, not, he should not be speaking on television about these matters and effectively imposed what his lawyer, uh, Mr. Dar Darren Thompson, who is now uh, has a very prominent position actually in the government, um, told him that was, was effectively a gag order because he would have been held in contempt of court if he decided to speak any further with regards to his case. The second problem that he had is that like many, fa like many individuals who um, need uh, support for their children from the other parent when they separate and don't have it, uh, he was having financial difficulties and uh, his uh, former wife was not paying the maintenance. So he decided to take the case back to court to try to enforce the temporary child support order, which wasn't a complete, which wasn't a full child maintenance order. Uh, because uh, in, in the Bahamas, the, the divorces don't have to be finalized, but there was a temporary order, um, and he decided to enforce that um, because she was past due on the payments. So this individual, my client, went to court. Um, he, he hired a, another law firm after going to the attorney general's office and finding out that they could not help him with this issue because uh, this is a divorce matter, and they advised him that he should just obtain uh, his own private counsel, even though this was a case about child maintenance and he needed it to be enforced. Um, in the court, there was a procedural issue that came up. And the judge, instead of deciding, well, this procedural issue can be resolved in another pleading, let's just have another hearing and you fix that procedural issue, the judge decided to throw out the case and fine my client um, because of the fact that there was a procedural defect in the, um, 
in the, in, in the pleadings that he provided. My client at that point was already in debt to the law firm that he had hired, and he could not pay them for the appeal, nor could he pay them to follow up in this case legally. And he didn't have any access to the state for support for representation in a child support matter. And so that is why he decided to come to the commission, because he was left with no other recourse in the system that existed in the Bahamas at that time. There was no state sponsorship of, chi of, of child maintenance for basically for, for parents who cannot pay their own children for counsel. Um, there was, um, you know, the state didn't, they, not only did they not provide direct representation, but they also didn't hire an outside firm or didn't provide any support to, to, to parents. And so he had to come to the commission um, and wait all of this time, in which time his, his children got older, in order to get child maintenance, which is a basic right for children. This case is significant not only because of the state's refusal and, and lack of um, attention to this matter, but because we argue that the state is required to provide, not only make sure that child maintenance is provided to children by parents who are non-custodial, but they have, a, they have an obligation to ensure that children are cared for by their parents and uh, provide parents the tools by which they should be allowed to, pro th that they can provide for their children. And that's exactly what didn't happen in this case. In this case, the state, instead of allowing, the, instead of providing the, the parent, uh, the custodial parent, Mr. Monker, the ability to raise his children effectively by providing him access to the past due child maintenance that his former wife didn't pay and providing him access to an attorney to be able to obtain that child maintenance, they, first of all, the courts decided to fine him for a procedural defect. And then he couldn't obtain any representation. Um, and then they decided to ignore his case until now we are sitting here in a hearing before an international tribunal um, and apparently they filed a response in our case, which we have not seen yet. Um, and this is the first time that they've responded to this case, which has been pending since 2010. My client, at that point, at, which my client will, 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 will answer to, um, the remedies that he was seeking are no longer sufficient. This case has had the reason that the issues have arisen are due to state actions, state omissions, and a legislative flaw, which is very important for this commission to understand. First of all, the state took actions in restricting my client's right to freedom of expression when he decided to speak, not about the specific instances about this case, but simply about the difficulties of being a single father, and in general about his case. Um, the state took action when they discriminated against him throughout the proceeding for being a custodial father, and when the courts decided to use procedural roadblocks not as a, as a, not to uh, continue the proceeding and remedy those procedural roadblocks, but as a, as a way to end his case and to make it so difficult for him to continue that he would have to go to an international tribunal. The state also committed an omission in this case. They failed to sponsor legal representation for him as a custodial parent who needed child maintenance and could not pay for an attorney. Finally, there is a legislative flaw that this commission needs to understand that exists in this case, in the Bahamas, and has existed in some other countries as well, um, which we've notified the commission of through our, pre through our pleadings. And that is that the, the, there's a law called the Child Protection Act of 2007 in the Bahamas. That law provides uh, different rights for different types of parents to obtain child maintenance. First of all, we would argue that child maintenance should be and is internationally recognized as a right of the child, not a right of the litigant or of the parent. And 
that is the first issue uh, where the Bahamas, we believe, is out of step with international norms. Secondly, the Child Protection Act of 2007 treats custodial fathers and single mothers differently than married, than married custodial mothers and single fathers. Custodial fathers in the Bahamas need to prove that they don't have the means to support their children before they can actually obtain child maintenance. Single mothers also have to prove that they don't have the means in and of themselves to support their children before they obtain child maintenance from the father. And this, we believe, would be fixed, first of all, if the Bahamas would just say that child maintenance is a right of the child and that the state has an obligation to obtain or to ensure that child maintenance is, is obtained by, from one of the parents. Um, but this, this has affected this case through, this affected this case throughout the litigation. Why? Because uh, as a custodial father, my client didn't have the right to say, well, my children need child maintenance because uh, they are entitled to it from the other parent, and she's not living with them, so you know, I, I need child maintenance for them. And instead, he had to prove, that he would have to prove that he could not support his children and that he didn't have the means to, the, 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 the ability to do so um, before the system would say, OK, now you need child maintenance. But all of these three acted together in this case. And that's why we have set, set forth multiple violations under the American Declaration of the Rights and Duties of Man, as well as under the UN Convention on the Rights, on the rights of the Child. Although this commission did not draft and execute the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, the, the commission has ruled that it is part of its corpus juris and that it may consider that in any case involving children's human rights. And that is why we have set forth those violations. Um, to enumerate some of those violations to the commission, we'll start with the American Declaration. Article 2, the right to equality before the law. We believe that our client has not received equal remedies due to, first of all, having to deal with a legal regime governed by the Child Protection Act of 2007, which discriminates custodial fathers and single mothers. Second, we believe that the family court system in the Bahamas has not provided equal treatment to economically disadvantaged custodial parents due to the lack of representation that's provided, the lack of available legal aid in the country, and lack of access to resources because of the situation in the law. Article 4, freedom of expression. We believe that there was a practical denial of freedom of expression in this case when Chief Justice Burton Hall threatened contempt of court and imposed practically a gag order prohibiting my client, Mr. Monker, not only from speaking about the specifics of this case, but from speaking about issues related to the case, such as his experience as a single father. This denial of free expression is not only an isolated incident, it's also enshrined in the laws of the Bahamas itself. My client didn't have legal resource to challenge that because Article 23 of the Bahamas Constitution, although it protects freedom of expression, it allows for restrictions on freedom of expression for the purpose of protecting the rights, reputation, and freedoms of other persons, the rights of pre preventing the disclosure of information received in confidence, maintaining the authority and independence of the courts, or regulating telephone, telegraphy, posts, wireless, broadcasting, television, public ex exhibitions, or public entertainment. We would argue that this is an overbroad restriction on freedom of expression, which is not in conformity with the with the text and the spirit of Article 4. There is an additional denial of freedom of expression in this case because the criminal contempt with which my client was threatened in the Bahamas allows a court to impose criminal penalties on individuals who use opprobious conduct in court. That is conduct that's, used, that's determined to express scorn or criticism of the court. We would argue that that is also an overbroad restriction on freedom of expression. The Bahamian Penal Code in Section 441 also allows for criminal punishment of a party who publishes anything with intent to excite any popular prejudice for or against any party to the proceedings. This is also an overbroad restriction on freedom of expression. And all of these laws came into play in my client's case. And it led my client to 
practically live under a gag order during this case. Article 6, the right, the right to provide for your children. Parents have a right to provide for their children and to have the state, the state has an obligation not to infringe upon that right. Now, in its legislation, under the Child Protection Act, the Bahamas discriminates against custodial fathers like my client, Mr. Monker, by requiring them to first prove they can't support their own children prior to obtaining child maintenance from the non-custodial mother. It also discriminates against single mothers, by the way, in a single, similar fashion. It's important for this commission to understand, 65% of new mothers in the Bahamas are single mothers. And I think there's something like 85%, although I, I saw this in a news article and I wanted to confirm it, but something like 85% of the families in Nassau, or New Providence Island, and Grand Bahama Island are headed by single mothers. So the fact that there is a law that makes it more difficult for single mothers to obtain child maintenance from the biological fathers and also affects custodial fathers is a is a situation that affects the right to provide for your children in two ways. And it affects po potentially the majority of new children coming into the world in the Bahamas today. The courts also restricted this right. The courts restricted Petitioner Monker's right to enforce his child maintenance order against the children's mother by limiting his freedom of expression, by fining him on procedural grounds instead of continuing the case to, because this is a child maintenance case. This isn't, a, this isn't just any case. This is about child maintenance. And we don't, we don't think that the courts were, should have been allowed to fine him and may, essentially, in practice, place an entry fee on his ability to access the legal system in order to just get child support for his children. Also, the court, the state did not provide him with legal representation or an avenue to obtain free legal representation denying him the ability to effectively provide for his children. I move on to Article 7, with, which relates to the right to receive special protection, care, and aid. That right is, uh, is, is violated in this case because Petitioner Monker should be able to have the system enforce the child maintenance order and that was, again, restricted by the courts, by the, by the state's denial of his right to freedom of expression, by the court's imposition of fines and by the delays on procedural grounds, and by the state's lack of provision of representation to custodial parents in this case. The right to preservation of health and well-being and education were also affected because by denying these children the access to their child maintenance, by these children not being able to receive that child maintenance for so many years, their health their education, their well-being was affected. And this affects my client, and it affects so many other parents in the, in, uh, in the Bahamas and in other countries when they are unable to access their child maintenance because a state decides that they're not going to support a custodial parent in their efforts to obtain that. There's also the issue of a right to a fair trial that comes into play. And why is an issue of a right to a fair trial come into play? Uh, we, I go back to the legislation, first of all, that discriminates against custodial fathers and single mothers, the lack of state-sponsored representation, and the roadblocks imposed by the courts. All of these conspire to deny him a right to, the fair, to a fair trial in this case. Then I move on to the violations that exist in this case under the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Those, those violations are protection from discrimination there was not an adherence to a best interest of the child standard in this case. There was, um, the petitioner had a right for his children to receive parental care and maintenance from both parents, not just from the father. Again, the, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child protects a, petition, uh, protects a child's right to health care. It protects a child's right to development. One of the ways that a child develops is by receiving financial support from both of their parents not just the one that has custody. And then there's a right to recreation and leisure, which is also implicated, just like the rights of education and health, um, when child maintenance is denied. All of these violations are, you know, th this, this, case, this case involves long-term violations in the life of children. And 
I can tell you, as an attorney who practices family law in the United States, I have also seen cases like this in the United States. Although the United States provides child maintenance representation to those who cannot pay. But it's an issue that there is also significant delays in payment of child maintenance, and that affects the lives of children as they grow, age, and develop. It affects their opportunities. And while the state may not have an obligation to make sure that each child has you know, the highest standard of living, it has a simple obligation to ensure that both parents support their, have their, um, follow their obligations to provide maintenance to the child. How does this case relate to the inter-American system? Well, I mentioned that there was discrimination against single mothers. Um, and it happens to be that there's a significant number of, of uh, single parents that have binational children. That affects the, um, that affects the entire uh, hemisphere and certain countries that where there's a lot of binational children. Um, so I leave uh, my time. I hope this commission will do justice, uh, will consider this case, and will um, require the state to change its attitude towards my client and towards its legislation. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Um, I'm afraid we have to be very strict with timing because of um, the situation the commission is in time-wise. Um, I now... Um, the, the, uh, the arguments for this from the state. I now invite the illustrious state of Bahamas, of the Bahamas. Hello. I now invite Hi. the illustrious yeah. state of the Bahamas to make your presentation um, for 20 minutes. Thank you, Madam President. Honorable Commission, thank you for given us the opportunity to respond to this petition, and we thank you so much for the petitioner making his um, presentation on behalf of the declarant. The Bahama Commonwealth of the Bahamas appreciates the opportunity to provide the following response to a most recent letter from the Executive Secretary of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Dated the 9th of April, 2018, to Honorable Minister of Foreign Affairs and Immigration, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. The Commissioner's letter requests the Bahamas to provide observations on the merit and respect of the petition filed by Cardinal Hunter on behalf of himself and his three minor children, Juanita, Alexis, and Candace, Felicia, and Hunter. As a member of the State of the Organization of American States, the Bahamas has demonstrated long standing commitment and respect for international human rights standards and recognizes the American situation of the rights and duties of men. As a source of applicable legal standards, these fundamental human rights are recognized and protected by the Constitution of Bahamas and domestic law. The rights of children are enhanced by the Bahamas accession to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, which divisions were incorporated into the Bahamas domestic law. Cardinal Oscar Monker, a petitioner who married Leslie Lee Shan. On 11th of December 1993, in Florence, South Carolina, United States of America, the union produced three children, as I previously had mentioned. Um, the petitioner petitioned the Supreme Court of the Bahamas for a divorce on the 4th of January 2007. He sought that custody and control of the children of the marriage granted to him reasonable access to the children by their mother. Further, that their mother be ordered to pay maintenance for three children of the marriage. On the 17th of September, 2007, pursuant to Section 27B e of the Matrix Clauses Act, Chapter 125, Statute of the Bahamas, the petitioner was granted an interim order by the Lady Chief, Lady Chief Justice Estella Ellis, Justice of the Supreme Court of the Bahamas. The interim order ordered that the petitioner be granted custody of three children to marriage and access to the children by the other every weekend. Additionally, the order mandated their mother to pay the petitioner $200 per month for the maintenance of the children on the 30th of September, 2007, and to be made at the end of each month thereafter until further order ordered. Lastly, the court ordered that the petitioner and the mother equally share in the educational expenses of the minor child 
Alicia Monker, affixed to the order with penal notice, which made other life or to be in contempt of court for failure to obey the order. On the 16th of December, 2009, petitioner made application to the Supreme Court of the Bahamas for an order of committal of the mother for non-compliance with the plaintiff's order by way of notice of motion. Subsequently, on the 18th of December, 2009, the Honorable Justice Rhonda Bain, Justice of the Supreme Court of the Bahamas, granted an order which gave the petitioner the right to enforce a rare payment. The order also granted leave for an order for the middle of the mother to prison because of a failure to comply with the maintenance order of the 17th of September, 2007. On the 1st of February, 2010, the mother filed a preliminary objection to the Supreme Court of the Bahamas that ordered, that ordered that order granted on 18th of December 2009 be set aside on the ground that the statement on which leave was obtained was materially defective and in breach of Order 52, Rule 2, Subsection 2. Subsequently, the Honorable Madam Justice Rhonda Bain, Justice of the Supreme Court of the Bahamas, set aside the order of committal granted on the 18th of December 2009. The court found that there was a prejudice caused to the wife as a result of the deficiency in the statement and found that in the interest of justice, a notice of motion was dismissed. Commissioners, Chapter 3 of the Constitution protects the fundamental rights and freedoms of individuals to which every person in the Bahama is entitled, whatever his race, place of origin, political opinions, color, creed, or sex, but subject to respect for the rights and freedoms of others and for the public interest to each and all of the following, namely, A, life, liberty, security of the person and the protection of the law, B, freedom of conscience, of expression, and of assembly and association, and C, protection for the privacy of his home and other property and for deprivation of property without compensation. Article 28 of the Constitution provides for any person to apply to the Supreme Court for redress when a fundamental right has been, is being, or is likely to be contravened. The Bahamas has no technical statutory requirements regulating or restricting, restricting how applications are commenced. Access to court for, reinfor for enforcement of fundamental rights has been liberally interpreted. The petitioners claim that they were unable to enforce the maintenance order of 17th of September 2007, which amounted to a violation of several rights under the Declaration and the Convention of the Rights of the Child. It is our position that facts contained in the petition before the Commission are not properly grounded as the petitioners have not provided sufficient evidence to how the alleged violations occurred. Notwithstanding this, the Bahamas has examined the claims of the petitioners based on the information provided. The Bahamas considers that allegations, alleged violations of various articles may be addressed simultaneously given the considerable overlap in the requirements under these articles. For these purposes, the Bahamas makes observations on the substantive merits in the matter set out below. The petitioners allege violations of Article 7 in the Declaration, which speaks to the right to receive special protection, care, and aid. Article 3 of the Convention on Rights of the Child, which speaks to the best interests of the child. And Article 19 of the CRC, which speaks to the right to health care. The petition alleges at the first paragraph of the petition dated 28th of July, 2010, addressed to the Executive Secretary, that under Article 7, to receive special protection, care, and aid, my rights have been directly violated because despite my multiple attempts to enforce the child support order granted to their benefit on the September 7th, 2007, because of deficiencies in internal judicial process, the order has never been enforced, nor has my wife pay of the child support order been penalized for being irreducibly in a red. Further, section one of the petition, the petitioner states that the best interests of my children were ignored despite evidence that their mother repeatedly violated the order for maintenance. Article seven of the declaration seeks to protect the rights of mothers and children and provides that all women during pregnancy and the nursing period and all children have the right to special protection, care, and aid. Article three of the Convention of the Rights of Child calls on all organizations concerned with children to work towards what is the best interest and provide ex interest of the child and provides that in all actions concerning children, whether undertaken by public or private social welfare institution, courts of law, 
administrative authorities and legislative bodies, the best interest of the child shall be a primary consideration. And I would just skip the other two the provisions, as I'm sure you're familiar with, and drop down to Article 19 of the CRC, which provides a state party shall take all appropriate legislative, administrative, social, and educational measures to protect the child from all forms of physical or mental violence, injury, or abuse. We'll go down to the Child Protection Act. There's a provision in that act. The Bahamas signed on to it in the, um, 1993. And this convention is incorporated, the provisions of the conventions are incorporated in the Child Protection Act by the way of section four, subsection C, which says that a child shall have the right to exercise in addition to all rights stated in this act, all the rights set out in the National United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, subject to any reservations that apply to the Bahamas and with appropriate modifications to suit the circumstances that exist in the Bahamas with due regards to the law. Also in the, convent, in the um, act, we have that in section three, um, subsection one, whenever a determination has to be made with respect to the upbringing of a child, the child's welfare shall be the paramount consideration. And we go down to section two, in all matters relating to a child, whether before a court of law or before any person, regard shall be had to the guiding principle mentioned subsection one, that any delay in determining the question is likely to be prejudicial to the welfare of the child. The Bahamas recognizes the best interest of the child as paramount and has established mechanisms to protect these rights. Um, just to speak to some, a few of the issues that the um, Bahamas government um, has in place for children under the social Department of Social Services, there's foster care, the school allowances, lunch programs, residential care, day service for early child development. But um, in relation to his claim for health, um, for the young girl, um, the young petitioner who uh, had health issues, the Ministry of Health has established a school health program in conjunction with the Ministry of Education with the view of ensuring optimal health for government school students, thus enabling them to attain most from their education. This is facilitated by a cadre of healthcare professionals, including school, including school nurses, dental nurses, trained clinical nurses, and health aides who canvass the school on a regular basis, providing both preventative and curative services. And to safeguard the immediate care of the students, they have a school clinic that's open daily and referrals are made by the school teacher, parents, school guidance counselors, and by um, teachers. The Bahamas position is that the fact that the practitioner was unable to enforce the maintenance order as plain does not amount to a violation of the rights afforded under Article 7 of the Declaration and Article 3 of the Convention of Rights for Child. However, if the petitioner was in fact unable to provide special protection, care, and aid for his children, he could have availed himself of the services provided by the Department of Social Service and the Ministry of Health. The petitioner has also alleged their rights under Article 4 of the Declaration, which is the freedom of investigation, opinion, expression, and dissemination has been violated. Petitioner's attorney in his letter dated 29th of May 2008 wrote to the petitioner and advised as follows. We wish to remind you of the Chief Justice's warning that you avoid publishing the details of any court order in relation to this matter as to, as to so will put you in contempt of court. Section 1 of the petition dated the 29th of July 2010 states that during the hearing related to my April 24, 2008 after David on May 8, 2008, and now retired Senior Justice on the Bahamas Supreme Court focused only on my wife's attorney's petition concerning an interview I gave to the local newspapers. And his um, account of that goes on a bit, so I'll just jump to the declaration that um, corresponds to this in, chapter, in Article 4 that says that every person has the right to freedom of investigation, of opinion, and of expression and dissemination of ideas by any medium whatsoever. In our Constitution, in Article 23, it states that protection to the right to freedom of expression of individual and expressly states, except with his consent, no person shall be hindered in the enjoyment of his freedom of expression. And for the purposes of this article, the said freedom includes freedom to hold opinions, to receive and impart ideas and information without interference and freedom from interference with, it, with his correspondence. And in section two, it says, nothing contained in or done under the authority of any law shall be held to be inconsistent with or in convention of this article to the extent of the law in question. 
and we'd like to um, share a case of we and G, which is represent the child, just demonstrates how the court treated issues of contempt involving family matter. At paragraph 20 and 21, the court noted as follows. There's a plain distinction between a case where a party to proceedings is alleged to have been in breach of an order of the court made in the proceedings and one where a party has done something which, although not in breach of a specific order, nevertheless, for one reason or another, contempt of court. In family cases where the court has made prohibited steps order or granted a non manifestation order, the breach of the order will be direct contempt and the procedure is well known. In the present case, the suspended committal order was not made because the father was in breach of the specific court order. And um, we also say that in the same case, it illustrates where a matter before the court is pending, the litigant should refrain from discussing particulars of the matter to the media, as this may amount to a litigant being held in contempt of court. In the petitioner's case, the Supreme Court of the Bahamas was empowered to find on a contempt of court, given that the publicity of the case through the petitioner's appearance on television not only prejudiced the interests of justice of the proceedings, but also the welfare of his minor children. However, the petitioner was not held in contempt of court, but was warned not to speak to the media while the matter is before the court. In light of this, the court's warning did not amount to a violation of the petitioner's right to freedom of expression. Another violation that um, the petitioner has alleged is Article 6 of the Declaration, the right to provide for his children. Paragraph 2 of the petitioner states that additionally to their detriment, my rights on Article 4, sorry, 6 to provide for them have been violated. The declaration says that every person has the right to establish a family, the basic element of society, and to receive protection there. Uh, the fact that the petitioner had difficulty enforcing the maintenance order, as alleged, does not in any way violate his right to establish a family and to receive protection for the purposes of Article 6 of the declaration. If one of the citizens of the Bahamas was having difficulty providing for his family, the state has numerous initiatives that can assist with food, education, uniforms, medicine, and medical expenses. Commissioners, the petition also states that he, his right, he did not have a right to a fair trial. The petitioner said in his petition, the actions of the judge not only violated my children's right to special protection by not addressing child support law of my rights to provide for them, but also monitor unfair trial. On February 4, 2010, my wife's attorney argued that the ex parte application recently approved by the judge had been deficient and should be dismissed. And the petitioner spoke in great length to that um, um, violation that he's submitting. And we're just going to say that in um, that we're saying that that didn't amount to a judicial uh, lack of his fair trial being um, violated. In Article 18 of Declan says that every person may resort to the courts to ensure respect for his legal rights. There should likewise be available to him a simple brief procedure whereby the courts protect him from the acts of authority. Commissions, the petitioner filed an ex parte summons and after date on 16th of November 2009 for application for order of committal of his wife. The statement did not indicate particulars in respect of the allegation, alleged violation of the maintenance order. The court, we have, sorry, the government has provided a um, case there, which I would not go through due to the sake of time, but one that we think would shed some light on the government's position to this um, violation, alleged violation that the petitioner has put forth. But we would say the Bahamas courts have decided on a similar point in L versus N. The court held that the statement contained the ground for committal in that it requested an order that an N be committed to her majesty prison for her contempt of court for not complying with the order dated the 3rd of March, 2005, to pay for the petitioner the sum of $400, months, $400 per month for the 1st of April, 2005, and half of the school fees, books, uniforms, and school supplies. In the petitioner's case, the court found that the petitioner's statement was not properly made out. L versus N can be distinguished from the petitioner's case as his statement did not state particulars that were required in R52, Rule 2. The Bahamas submits that the option available to the petitioner was to make necessary amendments to his statement and to return before the court so the court may properly decide on the matter before it. Um, the other violation that the petitioner is um, asserting is under Article 2 of the Declaration, the right to equality before the law. Um, his explanation is before you, the commissioner, so I would not read that. And the declaration for that is. Um, 
all persons are equal before the law and have the rights and duties established in this declaration without distinction as to what race, creed, or language. Um, section 33 of the Child Protection Act provides that subject to these provisions of this act, every man is hereby required to maintain his own child and also every child, whether born in wedlock or not, with his, which his wife may have living with her at the time of the marriage, to him, so long as such children are unable to maintain themselves. The petition has alleged that his right to equal equality before the law has been violated by the courts in the Bahamas. Counsel for his petition, as he said before, insisted that single parents are not able to access maintenance because of the significant legislation clause in the Bahamas. Um, Council insisted for the legislative flaws in law involves unequal treatment of custodial fathers and single mothers under Bahamian law, which respect to their ability to obtain maintenance for their children. Moreover, the applicable law at the time of the filing of the petition and subsequent maintenance order of the Marshall Causes Act, in particular, Section 27, which states that on granting a decree of NISI, a decree of nullity in marriage, or decree of judicial separation, or any time thereafter, the court may make any one or more of the following orders. And in the document that you'd have before your commissioners, we go through that to provide the different um, types of orders that they have been made. But I will look at um, D that says, an order that a party to the marriage shall make to such person as may be specified in order for the benefit of a child of the family, or to such Hello, Carry you're on. running out of time. You're running out. We've been trying to show you the flags for time left. Oh, I'm so sorry. Hey, we, I'll just conclude right now. Sorry. We didn't see the flags. Okay, the other um, violations, um, commissioners and Madam President, that he speaks to the right to education. What we're saying, the government's position to that is that um, the government of Bahamas provides publicly funded education, and Section 22 of the Education Act provides for compulsory education for children between five and 16 years of age to attend school. And in fact, one of the documents the petitioner exhibited to his petition is a report card from one of the government schools, C.S.C. McPherson Junior High School, where his daughter, Kanita, attended grade seven, and according to the report card, her performance was excellent. So we're saying that he was able to, um, there was schooling that would have been available if he had difficulty for, um, providing for um, private school. And under, as far as the, his uh, violations under the CRC protection from discrimination, right to development, right to creation and leisure, we're saying that the fact that the petitioner had difficulty enforcing these, the maintenance order as alleged, does not amount to a violation of the right to protection from discrimination, right to development, and the right to recreation and leisure. And in conclusion, the Bahamas considers there are available, adequate, and effective remedies under its domestic legal systems. However, there has been no attempt by the petition to pursue or exhaust all available remedies under domestic law as it relates to rights claimed to have been violated. The petitioner has not only had adequate but effective remedies available to them, but did not avail themselves of the remedies. In particular, the petitioner have not filed any constitutional motions pursuant to the Constitution of the Bahamas. As outlined, the Constitution supports the right and access to justice consistent with international standards. The Bahamas acknowledges that the Commission has a clear and legitimate interest in questions regarding the promotion and protection of human rights. And we'd also like to say, uh, Madam President, that the Bahamas extends its apologies for its lack of response and delay in responding to its petition, and this is in no way the government's intention. The, ba the Bahamas, in the way forward, makes a commitment to be more diligent and adhering to its obligations to respond to future petitions that are submitted before this Commission. And thank you so much for the extended time. That, thank you very much. Um, I think we will now go straight on to hear the declaration of the victim um, so that we, we can do with that. That, that would be 15. But what about him, his declaration? Oh, yes, you will, make, you will question him so he can give his, de his declaration in f for 15 minutes. And the state will also have 15 minutes to question the victim. Um, 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 the state of Bahamas, uh, we, will, we will try to assist you when you have five minutes left, three minutes left, and one minute. 
by putting a flag <laughs> before the camera. So if one of you can keep an eye out. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Thank you. So, um, um, uh, Mr. Petitioner, please, uh, could you lead your, your client in evidence? Thank you, Madam President. Um, let me give the opportunity to the petitioner just to introduce himself uh, to the commission. Uh, Mr. Monker, go ahead. Good afternoon, all. Cardinal Monker. Speak you, into you're gonna have the to speak up. Speak into the microphone, please, closer and, and clearly and loud. Give me a second. Good afternoon, all. Is that better? <clears throat> Excuse me. Is that better? Yes, it is. Okay. Good afternoon again. I am Cardinal Oscar Monka. The petitioners, one of the petitioners. I am father of Kanika, Kiana, and Delicia Monka. And in that regard, I have filed that petition with the assistance of my attorney, Randon, David Randon, um, trying to get redress um, we feel for my daughters um, before the commission. Mr. Monker, um, I'm going to ask you to speak up when you, an when you answer these questions so that we can all hear you and so it can be registered as part of the record. Um, yes, sir. The first question I'm going to ask you, um, because of the, the way that the hearing took place, I'm going, to want, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions to address um, some specific um, issues in your case um, that I think only you can explain. Um, so the first question I have for you is, there's a question from the state as to what steps you took to, uh, to resolve your case. And so I'd like you, in your own words, to explain the steps that you took to obtain the support of the state in enforcing the child maintenance order against your wife and the state's response to those efforts. Regards to my children receiving the maintenance and approaching the state, I spoke with, we made reference to Justice Bean. And after that model with Justice Bean, I spoke with my attorney at that time, and that was Palsby Chambers, um, because monies were not available at that particular time, Justice Bean was supposed to issue the order on the 4th to me. Because of lack of funds, the model was pushed back until, I think, the 12th or the 14th of March. Um, although February 4th was written on that paper, I did not go back to court because I did not have the funds. I approached Again, Halby Chambers asking what could have been done if there were le any legal remedies. I was told that there was no legal aid available per se for matters like that. There is a small fund, but that's more held for um, debt penalty, criminal matters of a more serious nature. Um, that's what I was informed by my um, attorney. They said the huge, I think they said the Eugene, the Puge Law School may could have assisted me. I made a call. I think through, they had Ms. Jeannie Thompson, who at one time was a partner or helped with the Halsby Chambers, but they had a number of cases. And due to the time that I had two weeks to appeal, if memory serves me correct, I had two weeks to appeal Justices Bean's order. And due to that two weeks window, um, the, the Eugene, the Puch Law School said they have people waiting for months and years. And I'm just coming in, they don't see no particular way. And from my understanding, from my attorney, um, legal aid is scarcely available. And with that, I turned to the commission after um, B 
being notified on in that regard. Did you um uh did you did you um did you ever approach the office of the attorney general with regards to your case? I did. The office of the attorney general. I spoke to staffers asking to um, make an appointment to see the attorney general. I was told by staffer that my matter is a simple divorce matter. The attorney general doesn't have time, so to speak, to deal with simple divorce matters. And they told me to go and seek the assistance of her attorney. And that's when, um, shortly afterward, not having funds, borrowing from family, friends, um, you know, taking out um, a loan, going um, salary advance, you name it. Just basically holding out a can to hire Holbury Chambers um, to assist me because that's what I was told I need to go and seek the assistance of an attorney. And Holbury Chambers um, came in and represented me and a couple other attorneys afterward. Um, most of those persons who I spoke with, um, attorneys in those said legal aid is very difficult um, and it takes long. And again, that's why I um, chose to write the petition. I spoke with um, some persons and through my Lord Jesus' help, I went forward and filed the petition at the commission. And, and, and Mr. Marker, did, did, when you interacted with the Office of the Attorney General, did they ever, um, did they ever tell you uh, whether the state could help with, uh, with representing your interests? Uh, mm. and, and, no, sir. No, sir. They did not. Their words to me was, go and seek the assistance of an attorney. And when that they said that, when they said that, they meant a private attorney. Yes. Okay. Yes, did, sir. Did, did you tell the state that this involved a child uh, maintenance matter when you interacted with them? Yes, I shared that with them. Yes, sir. Okay. And 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 what was their response to that? Again, I like I started before. Um, they said divorce matters. Child maintenance are simple issues that happen before courts on a daily basis. That is not a matter that their office particularly um, gives much time, credence to uh, seek the assistance of a private attorney. There are numerous of them out there who can assist. And from that, from that admission, you know, I never said, well, let me go back because I was not greeted warmly when I came there. Um, and like I said, I went around and all the evidence I presented to the commission borrowed to get an attorney. If they had said to me that this is available, that is available through the state, I would have gladly gone ahead and exercised that. But I was not told that. I was told to go and seek private help from, excuse me, help from a private attorney. Okay. Um why can you explain um, the state? The state alleges that uh, you were warned by the chief justice and that he didn't actually find you in contempt of court, so that that shouldn't constitute a freedom of expression violation. But can you explain how that was communicated to you, what your attorney told you, and also what you know what were what was the impact of the chief justice's statement on your case from your perspective? Um, the warning issue by the Chief Justice, if a Chief Justice gives you an order, a warning, pardon me, don't take it lightly. I was told that by um, my attorney at that time, um, Don Sanders at Graham Thompson, and he wrote that, he put it in writing to me. I warn you, take this matter I'm paraphrasing um, the words in the letter because I don't have it in the front of me. Take this matter seriously. Right then and there, um, Graham Thompson is not a nuanced law firm. If Graham Thompson 
writes that to you and tells you to take it serious, you do. In that regard, um, and I ask them to assist me with appealing it um, pro bono. They said they um, were not able to assist me pro bono at that time. I sought some assistance from the other attorneys, and they were like, they felt that it is a costly matter to go ahead and overturn um, the warning and with legally not being available and the cost of it, we just suggest that you move on and try and get maintenance for your children because that way would be very difficult is what I was told from um, Graham Thompson and other attorneys who I approached. Um, so how were your, um, how were your children impacted? The state also said that, well, there's access to programs and, and things like that, that your children, you know, took advantage of some of those programs, I guess, like public education. Um, but how, can you provide, uh, some knowledge very, as to how very, you were impacted, how your children were impacted by the loss of access to years? of maintenance and of the litigation and the financial and legal expenses that you incurred as a result of that? Very good question, sir. Um, she said that my children, every child has access to public education, everyone. Um, if they ch so choose to, um, their parents choose to enroll them, okay? Um, but for my children, my children basically stay home. They study, that's what they do. There was no money. Um, one of my children, one, at one time came home and I think she got a 2.4, sorry, 2.5 GPA once. And I remember that in grade five, okay? All of my children have been on the honor roll all the time, okay? All of them, because they study. Daddy don't have the money to go and take them out. They don't have access to certain things. So in that time, um, um, they study because they know, they knew. And I told them, um, I don't know how you all are gonna attend college or do things, I don't have it. I've tried to, um, to go before the courts. Um, it's been a very difficult situation. I don't know where else to turn. I advise you all to study and make something. And so that's what my kids did. Um, to say with programs of the state and so on and so forth. That was myself um, basically having the kids, checking their homework, speaking with them, praying with them, encouraging them to say, don't give in, um, just work. Yes, there are programs from the state. I'm not denying that, but I'm saying what my children accomplished was from a home base. And it's not one, it's all of my children, okay? okay. Um, and now, now let me ask you um, a, a, an important question because you have followed this case uh, because, uh, be, not just because of your situation, but because of your concern for others in this situation. How do you feel that a favorable decision by the commission in your case will impact not only your situation, but the situations of others in the Bahamas affected in similar situations? And what kinds of individuals do you feel are affected by similar situations such as yours? Um, it is widely known that I'm a teacher, okay? I come across hundreds, thousands of kids from single parent home. The majority of the support for me as I'm going through this venture is from single mothers, you know, who support me. Single mothers who come to me and say, Mr. Munka, I know what you're going through, here is, I only have $50, but you take half of that to go ahead and try and get help um, with your case and for your children. And so we are an all one group. And you know, I feel more for those things, because there's thousands of them. There are not that many custodial fathers that I know of in the Bahamas. There are not that many, but single mothers. Uh, um, that impacted. When you have a politician um, that came up on stage at a rally and said that there is no legislation in place 
that would make sure that um, single mothers get the just support they need from their fathers. And I am speaking about Richard Lightburn, who made those statements. Um, that is a powerful statement. Now, I don't agree with his whole statement, but for somebody of that spirit to say that shows that it's a widespread problem in the country and it needs to be addressed in some way. And there is an efficiency um, someplace in the system. Thank you very much, Mr. Monker. Uh, I have no further questions, and we'll, we'll turn it over to the state for their questions. Hi. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Monker. Um, yes, um, the illustrious state of bah Bahamas, uh, you have 15 minutes to question uh, Mr. Monker, Cardinal. You, you couldn't hear? You can start your questioning. You can start okay, your sorry. questioning. OK. Uh, good morning again, Commissioner. I'm Taylor Green Smith. Um, good morning, Mr. Monica. Um, good afternoon, madam. Can you hear me? Yes, good afternoon. I can hear you. Yes, good afternoon. We can hear you as well. Yes, good afternoon. Okay, we make reference to a letter that um, you would receive from your attorneys back in, on the 23rd of March, 2010, where she advised you about, this would have been a recipient, where she advised you concerning whether or not you wish to appeal your matter and we um, take note of all the issues you said that you had. Now, you also, you indicated that you approached the legal aid clinic, you gained the page legal aid clinic regarding your case. Did you, was there a, a request in writing to the school? To the school? To the, to the legal aid clinic, sorry. No, I, no, I, there was not. I said I spoke with Ms. Green, you referenced Ms. Green. I spoke yes. with Ms. Marissa Green, um, right. my attorney. Advised you right she advised me she said 14 days is not a long time and she said right. there are a lot of cases before um the schools the eugene depute school it's not a it's a private entity from my understanding and they have a lot of cases and they deal mostly from i was told by mrs green they deal mostly with um cases like death row and murder and those of a more, that they're saying, high standard. And mine, since I only had two weeks to appeal, and they had cases there for years, uh, up to two years, I was been told, it would be very difficult for me to go ahead and to get the assistance from that private um, legal aid clinic in two weeks. And so based on her speaking to me, I did not, um, I followed what she said, and I took it took her at what she said, even so, though, like, go ahead. So you took what your attorney, Marissa Green, did you, did you, did you speak specifically with anybody at the legal aid clinic, which is the no, public? No. no, I did not speak with um, um, anybody with, um, like I said, that's a private institution. No, no, um, no. just for clarity, just for clarity, Mr. Martin, not to cut you off, it is okay. a public it is public funded and actually it comes under the office of the attorney general. Okay, so it's publicly funded and um, okay. they would be more than willing to assist you once you would have approached that. Now you also indicated that- you, um, you, um, Excuse me, Ex excuse me ma'am. You said they would have been more than willing. Um, yes. I, I, I have to go on the advice of my attorney and um, from my, indication Jeannie Thompson, she told me, was a partner or a shareholder in their firm. And she was at one time the director or deputy director of that institution. Right. And, Ms. and if Ms. Nerissa Green told me that, and she is in consultation or speaks to Ms. Jeannie Thompson on a regular basis, I cannot um, say that Nerissa Green is speaking out of context. That's now, you also indicated that um, 
you would have spoken to, you would have approached the Attorney General's office. Do you recall what time, the year that you approached the Attorney General and who you spoke with, or did you submit something in writing to us? Mom, um, that was before I hired Ms. Nerissa Graham and Hall Street Chambers. Um, again, like I said, if I, before you, I had a letter. Yes, I did. I had a letter. I, if I remember correctly, yes, I did. I came to the attorney general's office to deliver the letter. It was not accepted. They were saying, "This, you might as well don't bother. Um, your matter is a simple divorce matter. And I, like I said, I cannot, I think that was 209, the latter part of 209, October 209, around that time that I approached the Attorney General office. And about two weeks later, three weeks later, when I was able to muster up some funds based on them telling me to go and hire a private attorney, I went and hired Narissa Green at Hallsbury Chambers. But I did approach them with a letter, which they said, you know, you need to go um, else and seek a private attorney. And do you recall who you would have spoken to at the time? And do you have a copy of the letter that you sent to, uh, did you attempt it to submit to the Attorney General's office? No, I don't have a, I, I took them, I took them what they said and go and hire, and I went and hired um, a private attorney. Right, I mean, and uh, correct, we would wish to state that the Attorney General's office do not um, engage in um, generally we do not engage in divorce proceedings unless we invited to by the court, but we would have directed you mm -hmm. to the legal aid clinic. But that was not that you're sharing that with me now, which I appreciate, but that was not the information given to me at that time. That was not the information given to me. And like I said, I appreciate that now. Yeah. I, al I also um, got advice on that. I spoke again. I shared it with Narissa Green, who was the attorney, and she gave me advice on that. And um, like I said, the, the advice on her is that you said it's government funded. It may be government funded, but from my understanding, it's a private entity. And no, so, no, Eugene, Eugene the Peace School Law School is not a private um, institution. It's funded by government. And it um, it's just unfortunate, um, Mr. Martha, that you did not um, take the opportunity. Excuse me, excuse me, one second, please. We yes. are having a great deal of difficulty um, um, understanding or hearing the words as you speak them. Uh, um, maybe you are a bit too close to the microphone, because, uh, or not you, sir. Not sure, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, and we can't see who is speaking. I should tell you okay. that. Oh, uh, sorry. Yes, we 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 really are having difficulty understanding the words. Uh, they're not articulating, articulated coming through, and so the interpreters here are having difficulty. I am an English speaker, and I am having difficulty, and I know the Bahamian accent very well. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Madam President, we apologize for that. I'll ask uh, Mrs. Smith to repeat what she was saying. Yeah. She'll just summarize what she said, if you don't mind. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, we were merely asking Mr. Monker whether or not he had approached the legal aid clinic directly um, for assistance. He indicated that he had approached the Attorney General's office. He wanted to know who he would have spoken to, whether it was a formal request to the Attorney General's office or whether also whether or not there was a formal request to the Eugene DePeach Law School for assistance. And we say, um, generally speaking, the Attorney General's office do not get involved in divorce proceedings unless it's invited to um, by the courts. But in, mo in every instance, once a party to a divorce approaches our office, we would direct them to the legal aid clinic for assistance, which is publicly funded. And we say that had Mr. Monker, it's unfortunate that Mr. Monker did not inquire himself um, of the services of the legal aid clinic as opposed to being advised by his attorney. If he had approached them directly, um, I believe that his case may have turned out a bit different. 
But um, may I speak on that, please? Yes, yeah. thank you. Yeah. She said, um, I went to their office, the Attorney General's office. That person could have advised me, like how she is advising me now. They can say, and she said it quite clearly, she said that they don't engage in divorce matters. That's something that I was told when I, uh, on a regular basis, when I approached the Attorney General office, which I made reference to several times before. Just like how she mentioned, the staffer who I spoke to um, told me that, but they could have referred me to legal aid and someone in particular, which they didn't. They referred me to a private attorney. So it's it's um, it's a it's 2020. Um, but I went to their office, and she's partly saying to me what they said to me. Uh, would do you wish to continue with the with questioning, please? No. Madam President. That's the old questions that we. Thank you very much. There, there is one more point, please. May I? Um. Yes. Very quickly. The state said that, and I'm about my kids, and when Justice Bain, um, with the ex, with the order that she dismissed. She said that I had, I could have gone forward and come back and amended the order, how Justice Bain, how it would be pleasing to Justice yeah. Bain. Something of that, in that regard. I'm, 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 um, I had two weeks, I had two weeks. I was in writing what Justice Bain said is, you are, you costed a petitioner, my children's mother. I had monies to pay um, Halsby Chambers, um, um, which I still owed them. I only finished paying Halsby Chambers about two months later, and I had two weeks. There was um, no particular way. The justice did not give me room in that to amend, so to speak, or to she did not give me room. It was two weeks for an appeal, um, and that was that. It wasn't, if she had granted me leave, granted it leave to say, this is deficient, um, 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 but even in that case, the best interest of the children comes into play. You know, even in that case, um, she could have, but it was not done. It was not done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I will now invite the Rapporteur on the Rights of Children to um, ask questions or make a statement. Um, she's, she will be speaking in Spanish. Um, how do we do that? Do you have an interpreter there? <laughs> no, ma'am. No. Um, Madam but, President, I speak fluent Spanish as well, so. No, but we do have interpreters there. I do, I'm, and we you have had. We have had Skype um, okay. interpretation. So can you? No. No. Yes. You can interpret into span into English. For for the for the persons in Bahamas to hear. Could you just let me know yes or no? The, no, no, but their normal way of interpreting, would it come through to the people in Bahamas? Well, okay, well, come, come, come. Yes, please. Quickly, quickly, time is a going. Oh, sit there, sit there, by the camera. Mm. Please let us know if you are not hearing the English translation when my, the first vice president, my sister Esmeralda, speaks, as she's going to do now. Thank you. Thank you. Bueno, quiero agradecer esta oportunidad de eh, tratar eh, un, un tema tan específico en materia de 
la protección de los derechos de los niños. I want to thank this opportunity to thank uh, for the, the participation to defend uh, the rights of children. Ok. Eh, tengo que señalar que no me ha sido fácil la, eh, in la interpretación de, eh, de, los, de los temas. Por eso voy a, a tratar de plantear cuatro puntos que me interesa, eh, si no la respuesta inmediata puede ser eh, después. I have to say that it has been really hard to understand and grasp the case due to the complications on the translation, but I would like to state four main statements that I'm concerned about this case. Bien. El, la primera, directamente vinculada con el derecho a la alimentación de los niños, de las niñas. The first, which is directly related to the right to food for children. Él cuenta, el peticionario cuenta con una sentencia de derecho a la manutención de sus niñas por parte de la madre de las niñas. The petitioner claims he has a sentence by the court for, to receive the maintenance for his children. El reclamo es que esta sentencia nunca se cumple. The claim is that this sentence was never complied with. Frente a eso, como punto uno, el punto dos. That's the first point, point two. Él solicita, el peticionario, solicita al Estado que se cumpla con la ejecución de esta sentencia. The petitioner requests from the state that this sentence that was ruled in court to be complied with. La pregunta, las normas en materia de la ejecución de las sentencias en protección de este derecho particular, este derecho a los alimentos. Nosotros le llamamos en, en nuestros países la pensión alimenticia. Eh, si la ley contiene una, una disposición que permita al peticionario, ante el juez que dictó esa sentencia, el reclamo de su ejecución. So the question is, if there is any mechanism in the law for the petitioner to demand to the judge that ruled out and did this sentence a way to demand the execution of such sentence that relates directly to the fundamental rights of kids to proper food. Y lo tercero con cuarto es el peticionario plantea la negación de el apoyo de asistencia legal que requería por parte del Estado para tramitar, y es lo que no comprendí, esa es la pregunta, la apelación, apelación que solo tenía dos semanas para responder. So the petitioner states that he was not given the state aid on legal matters to appeal for the execution of the sentence and that he only had 
from the beginning two weeks to appeal to that sentence. Porque el reclamo que hace de la responsabilidad del Estado para no prestar la asistencia jurídica eh, está en, en esta eh, en negación de, de, del apoyo de la asistencia legal porque no contaba con recursos para hacerlo personalmente. Because this, as part of the claim, since the petitioner didn't count with the means or funds to proceed with the appeal, and the state denied the, assist, the legal assistance they are required to provide. Entonces, para la pregunta, ¿cuál es la apelación que estaban haciendo frente a quién tenían que apelar porque requerían precisamente de la participación de un abogado. Eh, es un asunto distinto a la pensión alimenticia, a esa sentencia que ya había. ¿De qué se trata este, esta negativa de apoyo a de asesoría jurídica en la que se fundamenta precisamente este reclamo. So the claim done due to the denial for providing legal assistance by the state is it directed to the same sentence regarding the food pension that the petitioner was requesting or is this appeal in light of the fact that the state denied providing legal assistance that the petitioner needed to continue appealing the process in the first place. Eso es todo, señora presidenta. That is all, Madam Chair. I now want to pass the uh, matter over to Commissioner Flavia, who will make her interventions or questions. Thank you so much. I starting also endorsing my gratitude as my my the, my colleague Commissioner Esmeralda mentioned. It's a, I think it's a very important human rights issue, children's rights issue um, here. I, I would have I would raise two questions. One, uh, please, I'd like the clarification of the Child Protection Act from 2007 concerning the financial obligations of parents in custody. So, which is the rule? And, and um, based on this, as Commissioner Esmeralda mentioned, there is this judicial order that in this case, the mother would be responsible for alimony concerning the three daughters, but the judicial decision was not implemented. So my second question is, according to international standards, we have, according to international standards, and especially inter-American standards, Article 7 of the American Declaration, there is the right of protection of children, and all children have right to protection, to special care, especially guaranteeing their full potential. Uh, so my question is, uh, in the view of the state of Bahamas, and um, what would be the scope of the state responsibility? Because in the light of inter-American standards, this is not just a private matter, because it has this human rights approach, this human rights standards, and I would add as well Article 12 relating to right of education and um, health and all the rights that children need to develop their full potential and also in the name of the principle of the best interest of children. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much. Um, I just want to sort of um, see if we understand, because there was a difficulty of, of hearing. Um, 
the nub of this this case. Uh, the case, ha um, from what we can understand, has to do with um, the. It was based on the fact of a temporary order made for the maintenance of children in the course of divorce proceedings um, to the custodial uh, for the custodial parent to collect on. Um, from the access um, awarded parent. And in this case, the custodial parent was the father and the parent who had access was, was the mother. Um, um, it is quite clear, um, I, I, I think it came out clearly, and, and we all understand the fact that the, the right to maintenance is that of the children. And the parent, who is the custodial parent, uh, is uh, merely as the adult in the relationship uh, receives the payments on behalf of the children. And maintenance covers a myriad of the children's needs, i.e. to provide for what is necessary for the children. And it seems clear from the, the laws referred, which the um, petitioner rep the representative referred to that in the Bahamas, um, both parents are obligated to maintain the child. I am not sure if that's the case when they are both um, legally married, but in this case, it, you seem to say that it is. And certainly in, in the case of a single unmarried woman, it may be different, is it? Just nod. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, uh, the principle um, that we uh, operate by is that both parents are obligated to provide for the necessities of, of um, their children, um, which is a joint but not necessarily equal um, obligation depending on the capacity of, of each of them. And this, this um, it, Apparently, the, the temporary order was breached by the mother, um, um, and the, the, the victim has tried to have these orders enforced against the mother um, and for, for years, and it, years, I understand, and, and has failed uh, to do that. And there seems to have been, I believe I heard, an intervention from, uh, of a court which made an order um, not um, dismissing his application for contempt proceedings against her and for an order for her to pay up her arrears. Um, I think I heard that, um, which normally would have been the case because I have a family law practice that uh, part of my practice deals with that. So it seems that the points are yeah. this. Rights, of, rights of, of children to maintenance from their parents. Two, access to justice of the custodial father in relation to the um, repayment, payment of arrears of a parent who has been in contempt of a maintenance order. Um, three, right to due process in the legal proceedings which occurred in, in, in this situation. And four, um, exhaustion of domestic remedies and or a situation where the, the domestic remedies were not effective enough to, to um, protect the rights um, of these children to maintenance. Um, this seems to me the, to be the main points, the gravamen of, of the gravamen of the of the of the points before us, um, and we we understand that um, the the um, state of Barbados submitted its, its merits report yesterday. Bahamas, I beg your pardon. <laughs> um, yesterday, I. I um, it's, it's past lunch time, so I tend to get a bit fuzzy. Um, um, but the illustrious state of Bahamas submitted his merit report yesterday, which was mentioned by, by the um, representative here. And uh, we, clear, we clearly have not seen it. The commission, the secretariat itself, has not had a, um, the time to, to even peruse it. And nor has it been sent to the, the petitioner's representative. And this is a, um, a, a hearing of the declaration of the victim 
on the merits report. So when we kind of make a, a decision here and now, but we we have um, um, heard what has been done to date. <coughs> And because, because of our serious crunch vis-a-vis -vis time, we can only give um, you uh, both, both sides, two minutes to just cl make a closing <laughs> statement um, um, for us to end this matter today, because it will be a continuing pr process in the Commission. So thank you. If you, the representative, can speak first. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I will use my time to address uh, quickly the, the questions from Commissioner um, Esmeralda Rosemena and Commissioner Flavia Pivense. Um, the um, to, to answer your question, Commissioner Esmeralda, the um, uh, the order, the the denial of legal assistance to file the appeal has to do with the temporary enforcement of the temporary order that was dismissed, the request by the petitioner to enforce that order was dismissed by the judge, and that started a two-week period for him to appeal that decision, and that's where he was left without funds uh, for to support an attorney, and he went to the state, and they didn't give him the appropriate assistance. Um, and um, with regards to um, whether the law has a provision allowing the petitioner to order the execution of the sentence, I mean, I think he, he was trying to do that. Um, but the, the issue is really the access to justice, uh, as the president said, with regards to the legal representation. Um, and then the way that the laws, uh, and I wanted to clarify that for Commissioner Piovenza, that the, the Child Protection Act, while it, in this case, yes, both parents are required to provide maintenance, but the problem with the law is that it doesn't provide the children with the right to maintenance, which would then probably trigger the state to have an obligation to represent the custodial parent. Instead, it, it provides a, a discriminatory treatment of, the, of a custodial father and a single mother. And in this case, the custodial father, it, he did get an order, but he, 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 he could have been affected by it. And that what we're saying is also that legal regime didn't provide it as a right of the child and that the state therefore didn't didn't move forward with it. And thank you to the com thank you to the commission for holding this hearing and we ask you uh, we think that uh, the right to uh, the rights to child maintenance and the rights to freedom of expression in these proceedings are super important rights for uh, this hemisphere and we thank you for t giving it the attention that it deserves and we hope that the commission will use this as an opportunity to move those rights forward. Thank you. Thank you. I now invite the um, representatives of the Honorable State of the, the Bahamas to <laughs> uh, reply. Two minutes. Good afternoon. Tiffany Morris, Senior Counselor. We just want to reiterate so nice. and uh, hold the point that the Great. Child Protection Act mm -hmm incorporates the, I think earlier the question was raised with respect to the scope of the Child Protection Act. And we just want to reiterate that the Child Protection Act contemplates and incorporates the Convention on the Rights of a Child by way of Section 4C. And all of the, all of the maintenance, the, the, the obligation to maintain the child on the both parents are contained in the legislation. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to we want the petitioner to note that court is still in effect, uh, despite the challenges faced by him in having the order in court. That order is still in effect, mm -hmm. and there are remedies still available for the petitioner to be able to enforce the order. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, it now falls to me to, to thank both parties and um, to say that the process within the Commission and the Secretariat will continue in relation to this case. And you would be contacted in the usual way about the progress of the matter.
Thank you very, very much for taking the time to speak with us. It's always important when the representatives of the state, the state is represented and participates in the process because it then clarifies so many matters for the commissioners. And thank you so much for being, being so clear in your presentation on, in the representation of Mr. Monko. Mr. Monko, thank you very much for your clear declaration and we thank you for and thank God electricity came back and we thank you for your participation with that yes. being said we have to yeah I just would like to thank the Commission it's been years um, and Mother's Day is coming on Sunday and I'm just hopeful for future references for this matter that concerns children not just mine but the hundreds thousands of single women that there is a more clear path going forward for maintenance for all of the single mothers and mothers on the whole custodial parents on the whole and i thank the commission and i thank my lord jesus for this opportunity and we thank continue you. to thank you for 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 that yes ma yes madam yep. I was just yes saying, ma I, was just adding, I was just adding my thankfulness on behalf of the bahamas for this opportunity. Thank you very much. I like the Bahamas and know it quite well. <laughs> and also Mr. Monker for his um, participation. Thank you. Thank you as thank well. This hearing thank is you. now at an end. I thank the interpreters as well and the technician for assisting us. And thank you the members of the public for being present. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.